Okay, good afternoon all. Thank you very much, uh, Martin and the PA Society, for providing this opportunity. Uh, I'm doing my PhD research and the topic is the impact of health-related quality of life uh, looking at pernicious anemia. And this is part of a collaborative project between the Health Psychology Department in our university and the Abertau Bromorganing Univers University Local Health Board. And also we've been advised by a consultant hematologist, Dr. Devalia. So basically this study arises from the need to further understand why patients still perceive ongoing symptoms despite what is called regular treatment. So when a little bit of an overview about uh, my presentation. I'm going to talk about um, providing a little bit of context to this presentation. Regarding the, the findings of studies that I've done so far when I started, I'm going to focus on a pernicious anemia survey with the members of the PA Society. And then I'm going to talk about an outline of the study for that it's currently ongoing with GP surgeries. And then how all of these studies actually feed into the overall aim of my research. So as everyone knows, um, tests are not 100% reliable. Uh, they lead to delayed diagnosis that may result in irreversible neurological damage. So patients vary in their responses to B12 therapy and B12 therapy is lifelong. However, many patients feel the need um, to improve their symptoms, to have additional treatment, to maintain what they call an acceptable quality of life. However, significant numbers will request for additional treatment and sometimes this is denied by the healthcare professionals. So in a way there is a dilemma there because PA sufferers feel that they are not being treated according to their needs, while GPs may be following guidelines and concerned with early medicalization in transient and mild cases. So this represents a dilemma. So not receiving frequent B12 therapy or even additional therapy tends to increase patient anxiety and patients are quite distressed. When we're looking at this, we're looking at that there is actually no available tool to actually measure the severity of patient symptoms. And in the absence of physiological parameters of patient experience, we need to look at patient reported outcomes. The first study that we did was actually trying to look at issues in the manage management of pernicious anemia and we were quite fortunate to actually have local access to a GP surgery where we, I could go and actually look at patients' records. So the whole of the data that was there regarded family history, uh, lifestyle factors, why patients were taking B12, the types of diagnosis which they called problems, signs and symptoms, information about testing and what they say further comments. So what was really interesting here that initially we had 257 records of patients, however only 236 were actually taking regular cobalamin, meaning between one and three months, and over 90% were taking regular cobalamin within three months, every three months. However, 49% of this population were diagnosed with 12 deficiency, 33% with pernicious anemia, and then there were incomplete things in the records, so for example, discontinuation of treatment for, for no reason, despite diagnosis of pernicious anemia. Others have que had question marks, is it B12 or is it PA? So we're looking at lots of inconsistencies in the ways that records are kept, and also makes us wonder to look at the extent that actually these tests are not being carried out. So intrinsic factor testing was only carried out in 9% of the treatment population, and only 2% had a PA diagnosis signified by the positivity of the test. So some of the coexisting conditions uh, with these patients were depression, arthritis, uh, anxiety, and to a lower extent type 2 diabetes and dementia. The dementia. And common symptoms include low mood extreme tire and extreme tiredness. So because of these inconsistencies with record keeping, we wanted to actually clarify what is actually happening. So we did um, semi-structured interviews where we looked at open-ended questions, asking uh, patients, looking at from the process that they were actually diagnosed or misdiagnosed, the process of testing, and how they felt about their diagnosis. So there was a lot of experience of misdiagnosis, uh, depression and alcoholism, 
quite interesting that three of these um, eight participants, um, their diagnosis of pernicious anemia were accidental. One of them was being referred to a sleep specialist and the sleep specialist was the one that asked her to actually look at her B12 levels. So individuals felt out of control and lost their sense of identity when health professionals in their case failed to legitimize their illness by either attributing it to psychosomatic causes or to coexisting conditions. So in most cases, additional treatment was also denied by the AGP, which made them feel hopeless. And looking at the issue of misdiagnosis, many patients said that they really just wanted to know that they were not making it up. They wanted some, someone to tell us, you've got a diagnosis of pernicious anemia or any other condition, but I want to know what I have, otherwise I can't treat. So we wanted to look at what extent that these issues were actually happened, and we wanted to look at uh, the members of the BA Society view so they could be actually represented. So from this data and the themes that emerged, so what we call patterns in the, day, in the interviews, we actually um, this developed a survey and, and posted in the PA Society website. Because I, I chose to look at members' experience, because some of it, some of the data is quite similar to the PA Society survey that was previously conducted. So the themes that emerged looked at PA diagnosis being, being quite a controversial theme. Uh, so one of the patients uh, has said, the positive thing is that I've regained my self-confidence. I do no longer believe that I'm a hypochondriac. I can separate between mental and physical sensations that occur in my body, and I do not have more or stronger depressions, anxieties than most people do. So I'm in hope for the future. Uh, uh, These uh, PA sufferers feel like, uh, because of the issue of misdiagnosis, they actually have low self-esteem. So we were looking at B12 therapy, uh, and one of the themes that emerged was when patients actually started taking their loaded doses and then the B12 therapy, the injections actually made them feel like they were human, like the old bubbly happy me. Looking at treatment gap and suspension, discontinuation of treatment despite having pernicious anemia because it was called a considered normal levels. The, one of the reasons for patients to actually request more treatment regarded changes in their symptoms up until the next treatment was due and because they felt irritated and they felt um, distressed and with poor cognitive functioning. Looking at misdiagnosis, uh, feelings of anger, frustration, isolation, I have pushed myself so no one could see how ill I was and how much I was breaking down inside. When we think about ways that individuals would cope, first of all, they didn't feel like they had any control over the symptoms. They could only be controlled by treatment. Um, they couldn't do the most usual and minor daily tasks to attain you know, uh, the quality of life. And it had a huge impact on their relationships. Heidi talked about stigma stigma at work, intimate relationships, and most of it, the family being affected by it. So we can think about is, is the sufferer and the family as well. So ways of coping um, were relevant to regarded suffer, either suffering in isolation, having the PA society to support as a support group, support from their families, and also ignoring their symptoms, uh, hoping that they could go away and actually being accepting, accepting of their condition. So many of these patients, when I was looking at, at some of the data with the survey, the actually more frequent um, symptoms were the ones which were uh, perceived as less severe, maybe because individuals probably have developed an habituation of having those symptoms. So when we asked about how helpful do you think health services are in dealing with your condition on a scale of zero to 10, most, the average was three, so not very helpful. So one of the suggestions regarding uh, how health services could actually improve, looking at using active listening skills and after repeat complaints that they seek out other areas of diagnosis to find out what is going on with their patients. So basically, patients experienced 
unhelpful and distressful uh, consultations where health professionals, they felt that they didn't have enough uh, PA-related knowledge and they were unhelpful and dismissive towards their symptoms. So because of all of these themes that emerged, we wanted to actually have validated measures, something that we could measure against. Um, they were actually based on a patient perspective. So the reason why the study that is currently running, we managed to recruit two local GP surgeries. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that because I phoned so many surgeries and either they weren't interested or they didn't have the staff just to do a search of how many of patients and pernicious anemia patients were actually taking uh, regular injections or asking me for payment. And the ones that accepted have been uh, with us since the beginning. And another one that accepted said, I just want to make sure that the GPs are not doing anything for it. We are taking part in your study, but the GPs won't be involved at, at this sense. So we did a postal survey looking at measures of health-related quality of life. This is our measure of adjustment, how individuals are adjusted, looking at locus of control, because I had to look at other conditions that maybe are complex in symptoms, because there is no psychological, or what I say, psychosocial uh, research in pernicious anemia in this sense. There is a gap in research that addresses the variables that look into health-related quality of life, or the ones that can predict. Uh, in other populations of patients with long-term conditions, you look that higher levels of control are actually linked uh, with enhanced quality of life. But we need to know what's happening with the PA population, because there's nothing out there. And if we think that most of the health conditions have a quality of life measure, uh, pernicious anemia hasn't got one. So the results of this study, actually I wanted to extend it to an online population as well, is currently with the PA Society, has a link. So I would appreciate your support if you could fill out that survey if you're not taking part in your GP surgery. Because the results of the study are really important because they'll feed into the overall aim of this research, which is to develop a patient-centered measure to identify health-related quality of life in patients that suffer from pernicious, with pernicious anemia. This is not intended for diagnosis, but to aim to improve management from a patient's perspective. And because we're looking at increased functioning, looking at patient outcomes because of the subjective declines in physical and psychosocial functioning. And we're looking at treatment to be hopefully addressed um, according individual needs. So this is the aim of this um, screening measure. So our conclusions, obviously there is a dissatisfaction with the treatment regime. And because we're looking at the symptoms that actually emerge from individuals' accounts, from the interviews, from the PA Society members' views, and because they've reported experiencing major disruptions in their quality of life. And why do you want to apply a health psychology perspective? It's, when we think about psychology, many people may think, or they're thinking that the symptoms are in our head. Not, we're not thinking in that way. So when we're thinking about applying a health psychology perspective, we're looking at, looking at the individual in what we call a holistic way. So treat the individual experience. Look at patient history. Look at the social environment. Look at the context. As a look at the biological side of it as well, obviously, but look at what is the influence and what is the experience of the individual. So look at the individual as a whole. So this would uh, potentially improve patient adjustment and patient's outcomes as well. So currently there is no tool that allows clinicians to understand the health status of their patients. So it may benefit PA sufferers as well as to adjust the treatment according to their needs improve patient outcomes, enhance health-related quality of life, uh, and also strengthen the doctor-patient relationship, which in many cases seems that it's broken. Treatment, uh, PA treatment is uh, supposed to limit symptoms, increase functioning and delay progression. However, the current standard of care may not reflect that. This is the link. So. If you are able to do it, I would be so much grateful. Or if you do require a paper copy, just come and see me and we'll take care of that. 
Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Manera. Uh, are there any questions? There is one up there. Um, yeah, my question's about uh, neuropathy and whether or not during your study you found any of the records showed that there was an improvement in neuropathy with patients when they were receiving B12 treatment. Uh, that was most basically when I did the interviews and the patients did say that they felt improvement in symptoms, the neurological symptoms, because some of them developed neurological damage as well as a result of a delay, delayed diagnosis. I haven't looked at neurop uh, neuropathy per se just on its own and improvement of symptoms and that's a very interesting thing. Um, however, the, the accounts that I have are from the semi-structured interviews, patients saying they feel better, however they do feel the need of more, of more frequent injections up until time that the next injection is due. Perhaps interested in the, in the views of, of people in the audience. So I'm Mark Pritchard, I'm a gastroenterologist in, in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And I have a slightly different perspective to some of this in that in many other chronic conditions, mm -hmm. there are specialist services, often with a lot of support for patients with specialist nurses and things like that. So I'm involved in a service for inflammatory bowel disease, so there mm -hmm. are sp specialists involved, specialist nurses providing support, and a well-developed si system whereby patients are, are monitored, they're having various tests regularly to monitor for complications. Mm -hmm. My perception in pernicious anemia is that isn't the case. So there are a range of different clinicians involved, hematologists, neurologists, gastroenterologists, but maybe not sometimes a, a sort of coherent multidisciplinary specialist approach for patients. So I'm personally not aware of any specialist services in the UK, but I may be wrong and I'd be interested if, if there are. Are there any specialist clinics that can provide the appropriate multidisciplinary care for patients as we do in other chronic conditions? It may not, not everybody needs to be referred to these clinics. So some patients are very well on their three monthly injections and they can be poorly managed in primary care. But there's obviously a number of patients, many of whom in this room, who need that sort of specialist input, and I'm not aware of those services existing in the UK, but I'd be interested if anybody can tell me if they are. Uh, quite true, I'm not aware of those either. And then I agree that pernicious anemia needs a multidisciplinary team to actually look at this condition because it's not only about uh, the psychological or not only about the biological, there are different kinds of specialties that actually need to come into play. And it's very surprising that there is none. There is no support. And I was thinking that, you know, one of the things that I would like to extend uh, the study was to actually look at, you know, developing PA clinics like there are PA clinics for diabetes or for other conditions as well. And I think it's really, really important. But that would warrant funding and all of that. the next speaker. I just, I just wanted to ask, when you've been um, liaising with the GP surgeries and the patients together, um, do you ever address that they marry up what information is recorded to what the patient feels, you know, they've been told, etc.? Yes, um, on, my, uh, on the surveys that I've, uh, that I've looked at, the first, that when I looked at the patient's records actually, uh, one striking thing that I forgot to say is that we didn't find any comments regarding requests for more additional treatment. There was zero. Um, when we think about feelings of, of patients, what they call about the health professionals is that they are actually, they can't um, discuss with their GPs something that the GPs don't recognise and they don't feel like they have the related knowledge to actually be, be able to tell them what pernicious anemia is, that when they were break down the news of the diagnosis, they were just told that they just needed injections of B12. Uh, no other support of information was given. It's quite striking because some, quest some questionnaires on, on this survey are coming back to me from the surgeries. And I have patients actually writing me letters saying why don't they don't want to participate. One of them said, I take B12 injections and of. And then I had another patient saying, 
Thank you very much for this. I'm going to look at asking my GP for more inject injections. And when I asked if, if the participants, the patients were member of a support group, they said I was even aware, I wasn't even aware that there was a support group for pernicious anemia. 